In this tutorial you will learn some advanced techniques on backplate integration. For this we will first discuss various issues when using backplates, then use localized adjustments to match both foreground and background, and finally discuss various masking techniques available directly in the frame buffer. So in this video here, we're gonna be discussing some advanced frame buffer techniques on backplate integration. And you're gonna learn how you can integrate any kind of 3D object into any kind of backplate. For this, for example, we will learn how we can add some localized tone mapping here to our 3D objects. So that we basically match a tone mapped rendering with an already tone mapped backplate. And then we're also gonna apply some additional on top adjustments that apply to everything so that we can generate certain kind of looks and by this way get a completely finished result. If you're interested about the car here itself, you're lucky there's a full course on car rendering that's available on my Patreon. So you can check this out if that's interesting for you. Other than that, let's just jump right in and see how this scene here was set up. So whenever I try to integrate a 3D object into a backplate, I normally tend to work with these kind of like dummy objects here first, in this case, these kind of spheres, with some very simple shaders just to make sure that my lighting matches, that my reflection matches, that my refraction matches, and that the intensity of my reflection here matches. So lighting wise, this scene here is set up very simple. We just have this dome light, which is responsible for the diffuse lighting and the reflections. And then I just have some additional light here coming from the top. So we have some additional directionality and some more stronger shadows. If you're interested on how to match the reflections and diffuse lighting to your backplate, there's also a two part tutorial on my channel. The link should pop up somewhere here in the upper right corner right now. So you can check out this first if you want to know exactly how to match this. So let's talk first about the backplate and you can see at the moment I use a backplate already and I do this by just going into the environment and effects tab and then inside here I just use a simple backplate as a V-Ray bitmap. Let's disable this and I will show you a different option how you could add a backplate here. You could also do that directly in your frame buffer. So let's try to do that. Let's add here a new background element and then let's load here the backplate. And this also works to some extent, but I will show you various issues with that. So for me, I found there are certain kind of issues when using this background element. For example, here we have these kind of half transparent pixels from our lens effects. And because these parts here are very bright, we have this kind of glow here around the sphere. You can see when using this background element, we have this kind of issues here where we have these kind of really weird colors. And also for those shadows, we have these kind of really noisy appearance. Let me just show you how it looks like when I use this option here that I use it from the environments and effects tab. So once the denoiser here updates, you can see the shadows here are completely smooth and also the lens effect now looks completely correct. So this is one issue. Another issue is here for the refractions. So if I disable here my background again and I use this background element, you can see it just takes this black background color. Even though we have this backplate, because this backplate is just part of the frame buffer basically, it doesn't really show up here in our refractions of this sphere here, for example. So once I disable this again, you can see that now the refractions here are correct in the sphere. And the last problem that I have when using this background element is that I cannot really use this real zoom feature. So now with this option here enable, I can zoom in and out and everything here works nice and good. But if I disable this here and I use this background element, let's zoom in and out. You can see that only our 3D elements here are zooming and the backplate here stays exactly where it is. So that's why basically I don't really tend to use this background element. I rather just like to use this background here in the environment and effects tab. So while using the backplate here in the background tab has certain kind of advantages, which I just demonstrated, it also has some 
disadvantages, which we can avoid, but I have to show you what those are. So what we have here, first of all, is that we have a tone mapped backplate. So this one is, for example, a JPEG that comes from our camera. So it already has some tone mapping procedures applied to it so that it looks correctly on the monitor. And then we have here our 3D rendering, which is a linear image. So it means we also have brightness values much higher than one. So if you check these kind of color pickers down here, if I hover over those highlights, you can see that we have like brightness values here of two while our backplate doesn't really have these kind of bright values and that's because here our linear image is not tone mapped yet and by this way also doesn't look correct on our srgb monitor because it has brightness values that our monitor basically can't really display so what we have to do is to apply at least a tone mapping procedure here to our 3D rendering in order to make it match to our already tone mapped backplate, if that makes sense. So the most basic way to do that is to apply at least here a simple filmic tone map on the image. Once you do this, you can see if I hover over those parts here, the brightness values will be at most at a value of one. That just means that now this linear image has been tone mapped. It has been transferred to appear correctly on our sRGB monitor. But one issue that you see now is that once you apply this filmic tone mapping here, it's applied to the whole image, also the backplate, where we don't really want to apply this tone map here too, because that's already a tone mapped image. And that is actually where this kind of workflow to use the background element has some kind of advantage. So let me just re-render this and let me just add here the background element. So once I load this here again, you can see that now here this filmic tone map, because it's below this background element here, only affects our spheres in here, our 3D geometry, while it doesn't really affect here our background. So now we want to mimic the same kind of workflow using here this method while using the backplate in this background element in here because as I showed you earlier, it has certain kind of advantages. So we need to find some kind of way to only make the tone map appear here on our 3D geometry. So for this, we can head to our render settings and just add here a new multi matte element. Let's call this, for example, matte objects. And let's put here the buffer to a value of zero for all channels. And by default, basically every object that you generate here always has a ID of zero. So once I restart the rendering, you can see we now have here this matte objects element where we have these kind of objects here masked out. You can see the problem is that it also does that for the floor. So I can go inside and disable here the option to affect matte objects because the floor here is a matte object. So once I do this again, you can see now we only have here the spheres, our 3D geometry in a scene. And whenever I add a new element, it will also be added here to this mask. So now since we have the mask, we can then add here a new multi matte mask. And then we can show here our mask. For example, we just use the red channel and now this mask here is applied to our filmic tone map and you can see that now here this filmic tone map is only applied on our 3d geometry so what happens if you have a more complex tone mapping procedure for example here there are these four different elements we have a white balance we have an exposure adjustment some use saturation adjustments and a filmic tone map here in the end now if i want to basically only apply these adjustments here on our 3D geometry. You could add an individual mask for each of those elements in here, but that can easily get quite tedious. So a better way to do that would be to put all of those four things here in a folder and then just apply the mask on the folder. And for some reason, you cannot really create folders here. So the way you can do is that you switch this source here to a composite and then inside the composite, you can add actually new folders. So add a new folder in here and let's throw all of those parts here into the folder. And let's call this folder, for example, here LUT3D. 
and now you can switch them all on and off by once but now let's add here the mask so let's add here this multi matte mask use the red channel of our mask and now you can see that basically all of those four tone mapping procedures are basically applied through this folder in here so while that seems to work great if we check the detail you can see that now our lens effects here doesn't really have any kind of result anymore and the reason for that is very simple to explain basically we apply here our tone mapping procedure that means all the pixels here are clamped at the value at one and the lens effect which comes afterwards basically has a threshold of one in order to start to have these kind of lens effects here appearing. So what we can do is that we now can move this folder here to the top on top of these lens effects. And now you can see these lens effects here are picked up again because the LUT here is basically applied after the lens effects. So even though you cannot really create some new folder in here, you can drag the folder from the composite here all the way to the top and basically have all your tone mapping procedures in this one single folder in here. So now I removed the dummy spheres and I replaced them with this fully shaded car. And you can see that everything also works now without me having to set up any kind of new mask and so on because all of those objects here have an ID of zero. Basically the mask here is immediately updated to this one in here and the correct tone map is then applied to our new geometry. So now let's say you want, for example, to change here certain parts of the car, for example, the car paint. That's also very easy to do. Let's just add here a crypto mat and let's put the ID type to material name. And then here down in this composite, you can basically add a new folder and then also apply this mask here to the folder. So let's use the crypto mat and let's pick here the car paint. With this button, we can just make sure that we selected the right thing. Let's call here the folder, for example, car paint. And then let's add a use saturation adjustment inside here. And we can just easily adjust the U here of our car, for example, make it slightly more greenish here in this case. And you can also add, for example, a curves adjustment here if you want to play with the contrast of the car. For example, just make it slightly more contrasty and so on. So you can see all of this can also be done through folders and you can add multiple kind of adjustments here in those folders to just affect certain parts here of our car. So now since I have a fully tone mapped car matching a already tone mapped backplate, we can add some overall adjustments to achieve certain kind of looks. For example, at the moment, I think the overall thing looks a little bit bland, a little bit boring. So I have certain kinds of elements here already preset. In order to change that, let me just enable all of those. And you can see that now I have a much more contrasty, much more vivid look. So there's just some color balance, white balance, exposure, curve. And then I also have here a vignette option. And this one is basically just a background element here set as foreground. And then I just load here a simple texture map with the alpha channel that just basically darkens here the edges. And you can easily then just add some kind of vignette effects here directly in your frame buffer. So now using the same trick as before, we can create a folder here. Let's call this LUT overall and group all of those different elements together in one folder and this way make it much more easier to understand what's going on. And we can also move this folder then here below our LUT3D folder to just put it at the right position. So now you can see I can easily change the overall look of the whole scene and everything here updates accordingly. And we have a car that basically always integrates in whatever kind of color tones we choose for our overall picture. 
So now as a last step, I want to talk about how we can position the car here in our back plate. And now I try to position the car here in between those two pillars here on kind of this parking spot. And you can see there is a pillar here and there's also a car here in front. And once I start to render now, there's a certain kind of issue which you will probably guess and that is that the car is floating on top of the whole back plate and it's not really integrating at the correct position into the back plate. So luckily there's a way to fix that and that step is actually quite simple. So now in order to fix that let's go to where our camera is. The camera is positioned here and I just generated a simple plane in front of the camera. So here's the camera, here's the plane and this plane basically just has some parts here mapped onto. Let me just open the material and this is just a very simple V-Ray material and I just use an opacity map and this opacity map basically just looks like this. I just masked out the pillar, I masked out here the back of the other car and then I just went inside and make this one here not visible to reflections, refractions, cast shadow and so on, put all of this off and then most importantly put this one here as a matte object, alpha contribution of negative one and also disabled here generate GI and receive GI. So once I render this now you will see that now basically all of those parts here would be cut out as matte basically and now the car here is placed between those two pillars and even behind the back of the car which is parking in the position here in front. So as usual you can always find all of my scene files on my Patreon together with a whole course on car rendering if you want to know how the shaders for this car here were built for example. And there's also a lot of other additional goodies. So check this out if that's interesting for you. Otherwise I hope you learned something from this advanced backplate integration tutorial. Subscribe if you want to be notified about further additions to the series and also other tutorial releases. Other than that take care and see you soon.